It's time now for Ask the Surgeon, brought to you by Everett Bone and Joint. Everett Bone and Joint, the best choice to get you back in the game. Learn more at everettboneandjoint.com. All right, welcome back to Health Matters, um, IRG Health Matters. I'm Maury Eskenazi with Shannon O'Kelly. Again, if you want to ask a question, 425-304-1380 or go to IRGPT.com. Click on the Health Matters icon and submit your question. It's Ask the Surgeon, brought to you by Everett Bone & Joint. That's right, Maury. Today we have with us Jeff Mason, orthopedic physician from Everett Bone & Joint, and he's going to discuss knee injuries. Uh, specifically, we're going to talk about the meniscus and meniscus tears and uh, how the, the, the meniscus is rehabbed. Um, we had a chance to start talking about this at our orthopedic roundtable right. last show, but we ran out of time, so we wanted to kind of bring everybody back to that. But before we get started, I wanted to kind of get back to this uh, question regarding Eric Bedard and his shoulder. So, uh, Jeff, how are you doing? Oh, doing great. Delighted to be here. Um, so what do you think, uh, based on what you've heard in reports in the paper, uh, there's a frame in his shoulder. Do you have any kind of... Uh, uh, suspicions, or what do you yeah, think might be going on? The two things that come to mind most readily are either fraying of his biceps tendon, um, which can be very difficult to treat. If it becomes symptomatic, it's very hard to rehab it. Um, rotator cuff fraying could be the same thing, where you're not so much worried about the fraying in and of itself as what has caused it and why is it getting worse. Interesting. So we'll just have to wait and see. Uh, I'm sure a couple of days now some report will come out. So we'll uh, see how you did on guessing there. So here we go. Let's talk about the meniscus and set us up again anatomically. What is the meniscus? Where is it located uh, in the knee joint? Well, there's a medial meniscus and a lateral meniscus, which is to say on the inside and the outside of the knee. And they sit between the thigh bone, the femur, and the tibia, the shin bone. And what they essentially do is... Uh, provide as shock absorbers and they help control motion and they end up actually increasing the surface area inside the knee for the bones to articulate with each other so thereby reducing the force of any activity by a lot. So um, there's a, there's, uh, they separate the two bones uh, so technically they act like a bushing and they're made up of tough uh, fibrous grisly type cartilage? Yeah, it's fibrocartilage so it's not as smooth as the articular cartilage that covers the bones, but it's a lot tougher and it has the much more of an ability to change shape a little bit and deform according to forces, and that's exactly what they do. It is a bushing. And do you see a lot of this? It's a very common injury. It's one of the more common things I, that we I've see. had this. Yeah. How'd you get I, yours I, I again? Think I, I, I talked about this again, but what, you know, why not? It's, it, I have a show. Why can't I talk about <laughs> Absolutely. it again? Absolutely. I, I was on a treadmill and I stumbled on it. And I am. Was the treadmill on an incline? Um. Probably not, knowing me. No, it wasn't. I think what I did, I dropped my ashtray. And no, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I, I think I was light jogging on the treadmill, and I stumbled, and I kind of I felt it, and like, you know, I let it go for like maybe a week or so to the point where, you know what, I better have this checked out. So, Well, that's yeah. a good question. So tell us about um, if you tear a meniscus, what normally do people experience symptom-wise? Well, it varies a lot because... The meniscus is subject to wear and tear like the rest of the body in general. And so if you tear your meniscus and you're young and athletic, you'll remember some event, you know, you, your knee was uh, flexed and was twisted by some impact or the like. The older and more worn it gets, you can have some episode occur that in and of itself seems trivial where people say, I just twisted a little bit or I got out of a chair and they start getting some pain in the knee. We see tears in the inside meniscus, the medial meniscus, a little bit more frequently. So people will say, oh, the inside of my knee hurts. It's swelling a little bit. In many occasions, they start feeling a catching or a grabbing sensation inside their knee with certain motions. So generally speaking, do you have to be weight-bearing um, to have this injury occur, or can you be um, kicking something, for example, with your leg or your foot off the ground? It, it doesn't have to be uh, weight-bearing specifically, but we always see it in conjunction with some kind of force. So the foot is planted, and there's some kind of uh, force or rotation yeah, on the knee joint, and it picks that meniscus up and irritates it and tears it. Um, is that what happened? What were your symptoms, Maury? Um, pain, and um, that actually, you know, I think it kind of twisted a different way, and it was just like it was pain right on the inside of my knee, like at the top, almost by the uh, by the uh, kneecap, like to the right to the little, like kind of the left of it of the kneecap. Interesting. So it, um, it was constant pain. Don't, don't a lot of people, what I've experienced in physical therapy, when you see these people before they're diagnosed, it seems like they have difficulty weight-bearing and twisting, and they have a sensation of buckling or locking in their knee. Yeah, the buckling is caused by the uh, 
quadriceps muscle reacting to the pain where all of a sudden it doesn't want to function right because it's getting a reflex signal from the knees essentially saying, don't do this. Um, they can be any, anywhere from modestly to extremely painful. You know, that's an interesting concept that people need to understand is when the joint is painful, the joint talks to the muscles around it, and the knee joint being good neighbors basically with the quadricep muscles, if there's pain in the joint, will tell the quads not to fire, so you get this, that's where the buckling comes from. Yes, you can have uh, instability without any of the normal stabilizing structures really being damaged just because if the knee is irritated, it will behave that and, way. And, th- and this is something that just, it won't go away with ice and ibuprofen, too. I mean, you have to go check it out. Or is there is there ever th- an instance where you wouldn't do arthroscopic surgery? There are some because, like, the meniscus is a complicated uh, shape, and so there can be small tears. There are probably tears that are asymptomatic. So occasionally you'll get someone who has a tiny little tear that will subside within a few weeks and the symptoms will go away, and they may stay gone or they may appear when the tear gets larger in three months or nine months. But by the time they come and talk to us, they usually have something that you know need, needs some kind of intervention. So what are the treatment options out there today for a meniscus tear? Well, um, in people who come and see us and have enough symptoms, we perform an arthroscopic surgery. We repair when we can, but the vast majority of them are partial meniscectomies or we excise the unstable elements. I want to talk about that. So, I mean, I want to uh, uh, let everybody know what the difference is out there. So when you just talk about a, a meniscectomy versus a meniscus repair, these are two different procedures. And tell me about the meniscectomy and why you decide to do a meniscectomy. You do meniscectomies most often because the greater major- the great majority of the meniscus will not heal if repaired. It's not vascular tissue. It has no, so it doesn't have a blood supply to No it. effect of blood supply. So if you were to place sutures in it, eventually they would wear out and you'd, be, you'd have your tear would, would be there again. So if tissue does not have a blood supply, it does not heal? C- correct. So your best option is to remove it? Yeah, you take out the part that's causing the symptoms. Okay, then what about this repair that you talked about? Yeah, if you have a, a tear of the meniscus that's out near the periphery of the joint where there is a blood supply, it may be repairable. And we have all these different techniques and devices, and, and repairs are technically much more difficult, and the, and the downtime is much greater. We typically people keep people non-weight-bearing, um, keep them from bending the knee through a normal range of motion for four to six or even eight weeks, depending on the size of the tear, and that's when we have to rehab them. So if you remove the meniscus, which you call meniscectomy, what's the recovery time on something like that? Under the best circumstances, it's extremely rapid. If you have a, a young, healthy person with a small tear, they can be back to many of their normal activities, sometimes even in a couple of weeks. That being said, that's the most optimistic uh, right. projection. Normally, it's a bit slower than that, but um, you know, some people require rehab to strengthen the muscles again, depending on how long they've been down. So these these are the folks that are having um, what, what is called ambulatory surgery today. They show up at your office. You have a surgery center. They check in. This procedure takes this uh, how long? Well, to put it this way, I tell them that pre- preparing the patient for the surgery, getting the block established, getting them into the room, getting all the prepping and draping and all of that, all of that plus getting them out takes longer than the operation. You know, we make a couple small incisions. Right. Um, you know, and you're in and out in sometimes under 15 minutes for the surgical part itself. Are they are they um, leaving with crutches? We t- we tell them to use crutches only as needed. So most patients report that they use crutches for a couple of days, less than a week. Some not at all. Interesting. We're talking to Dr. Jeff Mason, orthopedic physician from Everett Bone and Joint. This is Ask the Surgeon. If you have a question, you want to ask the surgeon. If your knee hurts. Mine hurts just talking about this. Uh, give us a call at 425-304-1380. So uh, here's a question for you. What is the approach for the, that 50-year-old uh, worn-out knee? I'm speaking for myself, too, by the way. That, that, that depends entirely on how much arthritis is present and what the patient's goals are. Mm-hmm. Um, so here's a, here's a question for you, then. Uh, and I, I think I've asked this before. Uh, if I get a total knee replacement, will I expect... Because I can't run. I have avascular necrosis. Well, let's talk about that. Okay. What, what is that? Avascular necrosis essentially means that there's an area of the bone that has died, either from trauma or there are many causes that are not at all uh, well understood. But essentially, bone is living tissue, and if, and if part of it dies and will not revascularize, that is, say, heal itself, mm-hmm. um, you'll eventually get collapse of the overlying tissues and 
you know, you'll lead to a dramatically arthritic knee that needs replacing. So that's the prognosis for me is someday I'm going to have to have my, have my knee replaced. So if I get it replaced, like in the next 10 years, will I expect, can I do stuff that I can't do now? I mean, will I be able to, will it be like a brand new knee and... It, they work extremely well for pain control. Okay. If you work hard enough in rehabilitation, we have people who engage in all kinds of activities. Um, it was very interesting. A number of years ago, the uh, Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons came out with a list of those activities that are recommended or not for patients with total knee replacements, and they had evolved markedly over the previous five years when the last list came out. We have people who ski. We have people who I've seen them, people who work as cowboys with knee replacements, That's a little bit pushing it, but normally people lead, you know, they walk, they can go hiking, they can do quite a lot. Mm -hmm. Functionally, they're living a pretty good life. Yes. Now, what about this new, these new techniques that are coming out? Uh, We're hearing about these unit compartmental knees and bi compartmental. And so for someone like Maury, who's maybe not ready for a total joint, what are, are there other options? Yeah, a unit compartmental knees, um, they develop for people who just had severe wear and tear in one compartment and not in the others. So uh, compartment, uh, describe that. What, what do you mean, yeah, inside, outside of the knee? The surgeons sort of mechanically divide up the knee into the medial or inside compartment, the lateral, and then the patellofemoral compartment, the three okay. different parts. But we started doing unit compartmental knees when we said, gee, if you can r- just replace one compartment, leave all of the normal anatomy, including the important ligament structures, intact, you'll have someone who replaces part of their knee, yet their knee still feels like their knee. So this is a really good option for someone who's too young for a total knee, but is ultimately going to have to have a total knee down the road, and you want to save tissue, for example. Yes, converting from a uni to a total is not some technically uh, extremely demanding task. Interesting. Are you ready, Maury? You want to, you want to sign up <laughs> right now? Yeah, we can do it right sure. here. Yeah. yeah. I mean, how how would would it be like I'd be in total pain to have the, to get a knee replacement or? You know. they, they tend to be pretty painful for a couple of weeks. Um, total hips are easy. Total knees are not so easy. But people are overwhelmingly glad they had it done. Right. Well, so, I mean, if you have a... Uh, they got that device where you keep your knee every couple minutes. They, your knees is like... Yeah. Work. yeah. CPM. CPM yeah, machine, yeah. yeah. Continuous passive motion. Yeah, That's I've right. I've seen that. So what about... in uh, You know, I remember um, there was a time period where for these arthritic knees and uh, people that weren't ready for a total joint, they were doing these osteochondral drillings. Do you remember yes. doing those? Do you, do you guys still well, do we those? We still do them. We do... Well... You, do, you can call, they're called marrow stimulation procedures, which basically Uh-oh. means that... We're going to have to have some explanation there. <laughs> so it basically means that some people would drill and other people would knock little holes, and so the mechanical technique is different, so they tried to put it all into one heading. But what you're doing is you're trying to stimulate uh, the production of fibrocartilage or any kind of anything to fill this hole in the knee if you have a divot in your articular cartilage. So the cartilage that covers your joint is the articular cartilage, and it's normally healthy and it's smooth and it's yes. glistening when you get in there. And in arthritic situations, it's rough, sandpaper-like, yes. and it's got these uh, deficits. Yes. And so what you're trying to do is put little holes around that. that yeah, if you have a deficit that's um, just a real divot surrounded by essentially healthy-looking cartilage, you can either graft that locally or there are other grafting techniques where you can drill little holes in it and keep people off it for six or eight weeks, and it can fill in, and it can be highly successful. So what's the mechanics of p- drilling holes around it or punching holes around that uh, that divot, that cartilage divot? What, what are you trying to do there? Is that stimulate blood flow? Yeah, what you're trying to do is get um, the right cells, which live in the bone marrow, to migrate into that as part of the clot, and if they do that, they will form cartilage. This is what they call microfracture surgery that, you know, various NBA players that Greg Oden had down. The oh, yeah. And, yeah, and Amari Stoudemire had it done. And it, it worked extremely well on his knee, and Greg Oden looks like he's getting around okay. He had it on his, did he have it on his knee or his foot? He had it in his knee. Oh, okay. Do you see it, besides the knee, is there any other places where this occurs? We, we, we use it almost exclusively in the knee and in the ankle. And in the ankle joint, it's often remarkably successful for, you know, I, I've seen lesions that I've treated or Dr. Barker, for example, has treated that just fill in remarkably well. It's better, in the, better in the ankle, maybe even than the knee. Wow, so there's options out there. That's so fascinating. Interesting. Stuff. So they used to do this, um, what, what was called an oats procedure. I mean, where they actually, explain that. Are they still doing those? You're yeah, just going through the book tonight, aren't you? Well, it's interesting because it's that 50-year-old knee. I'm trying to give yeah, you some options here, Maury. Yeah, so. thanks. Yeah, absolutely, we're still doing them, and they can be highly successful. 
the limit to an OS procedure is you need to have a small enough injury that you have places in your knee where there's extra cartilage. You need to have enough extra cartilage to fill the hole. You can use you can use grafts from you know donors, and um, you know there are other techniques, but the oats works very well. Too. Well, will I get a discount if I just call every bone and joint? So yeah, I like an oats procedure for you if I kind of know what I'm talking about. I think they have a blue light special on Tuesdays or something. So. Dr. Mason, as always, every doctor at every bone and joint, you've been fantastic. We can talk for hours. Uh, we'll have you next time we do another roundtable. We'll have you in. It's been it was great having you. If uh, and if you want more information on uh, Dr. Mason.